Welcome back to part two of the domain range and I guess some inverse by examples. Again, so this is a topic within grade 11. Part one, I'm gonna put up a link up above. You should watch that first, which introduces you to um, several examples. Here, what I'm gonna do is you see actually quite a few examples and some of them are really ugly. So you have either relations or functions within here. And our goal is gonna to be to try to figure out what the domain and then the ranges are. And then if we can, um, maybe to talk about kind of the inverse of the relation or function, um, if it exists per se as a function. So uh, let's get started. So our first example is y is equal to four x plus five. Now, and when we have these examples, so I'm gonna take this in, I'm gonna copy it. And I love always introducing this as kind of inputs and outputs. So, you know, things that are coming in and then things that are coming out. It's almost like some kind of a blender that just outputs certain, um, well, in this case, some numbers. And I'm gonna stick this within here uh, because that is actual our relationship between the output and the input. Now, for all of these examples, what we have is we have our inputs now their x or I guess there's a t in there. It doesn't really matter what we call the input. Let's call it x. And our goal for the domain is always to be able to answer this question. So if you take um, your input and let's say your input is basically some element of the real numbers. Now they don't have to be real numbers. It can be of integers. It can be of whole numbers. You can restrict them to any number set that you like. Now, most of the time we will first restrict it to the real numbers and then see what we can do. So now I am restricting this and I have this set. So let's say this is my starting point, which is X is basically a real number. So this, these are anything, okay? So any number that we like, we're gonna stick it in here. And then our question is gonna be, if it goes through this blender, so in this in here, if we substitute for this X, are we gonna always get an output out? So does an output actually exist for a given input? That's really what you're asking when you're trying to find the domain. You're trying to ask yourself, all right, so for whatever number that I have, if I stick it into this four X plus five, does an output actually exist? Now, in this case, this is really just a linear relationship, right? Four X plus five, Really, so that's just a slope of four, and then you have a five. So notice, it doesn't really matter what we stick in for X, right? We can stick in any number that we like for X, and we're always gonna get a number out. There isn't any problem here. Um, so you can stick a negative number, you can stick zero, you can stick a positive number, big, large, whatever, and it will always give us an output. So, our domain for this particular first example that we have, so for this example, and it is true for any linear examples, and I've talked about this in past videos as well, um, in particular in that part one. So for this one, whenever it's linear, you are pretty much guaranteed, unless there is some kind of a restriction on the input, you are guaranteed that the domain is going to be Okay, the set of all real numbers. That is going to be your domain. Now your range, right? So either positive or negative because these are just lines. Now it has a positive slope, so it raises up. Your range is basically, okay, so what outputs does it take on? And again, for linear, it's going to take on every single output. You, as you stick in the numbers inside for X, you know, you multiply it by four and then you add five and then you go through the whole entire range from negative infinity all the way to positive infinity as you sweep yourself along, you will find that basically these numbers are going in the negative side for X, they're gonna become smaller and smaller and smaller. And then for the positive side, they're gonna become bigger and bigger and bigger. So my output in this case, so my restriction um, and my entire range is going to be all the real numbers. That's what we have. Now for finding inverse, again, for linear, it's always very simple because what we do is we just swap these and then we're basically just going in reverse in terms of trying to solve. 
So we swap x and y. So if you do that, so this is going to be x, this is going to be your y, and now you're going to solve for your y. So your first step is, you know, you swap them, and now you're going to isolate and solve for y. Now, if you isolate and solve this for y, you're going to get basically, okay, so here I'm just doing that for you, and you're going to get y is equal to, so 1 over 4x minus 5 over 4. So as you divide by 4 on both sides, this is your inverse. Now, your inverse is also going to have a domain and a range, and because your domain and ranges for your original linear relationship were basically all the real numbers, and when you're swapping them, you're going to get exactly the same thing. So your range and your domain for this, it's still all the real numbers. So you can basically just repeat okay, this for your inverse. So that's my inverse relationship. So my inverse kind of relationship, it is a function, and the function itself is given as another line. And that's what that is, right? Now, that's nothing new if you've watched um, some of those previous videos that I have done, okay, on these in terms of domain ranges and inverses. Now, what about this one? You know, so this one is not as nice because here we have a quadratic. And for a quadratic, if you're going to be doing this, um, now, so trying to find the domain and ranges, again, you have to think, okay, so for which inputs, can I put in here? So, you know, does a number, does an output actually exist for every single real number that I insert in here? Well, for quadratics, you know, you will remember that they're basically just parabolas, right? Um, and in this case, so notice your parabola, okay, so we're within here, so it's a quadratic, okay, so that is leading with a three, so it's positive, it's gonna open up upwards, it's gonna have a vertex somewhere, Okay, but it's basically going to look like some parabola like that, right? So that's what it will be somewhere within and whatever this vertex might be. I don't, don't know. I can't tell it's just straight from what it is given. And for any quadratics and actually for any polynomial that you will have, um, if it's just a polynomial, right? And, you know, so if you're graphing this, again, I don't know exactly how it's going to look like. So let's say if it was something like that, we can certainly graph it if we wanted to. And it's going to keep going, right, in this direction and in this direction. So my domain, again, is going to be basically any number that I like, okay, for x. Because anything that I substitute here for x, um, I can then just square it and then multiply by 3. And then add it to the 8 multiplied that by the x minus 2. And I will get an output, so some number. And because of that, I know that, well, A, so it is a function um, because I'm going to get unique outputs, okay? So I'm not going to get multiple outputs uh, for the same input. So it is a function, so that's that. My domain is going to be, again, the entire real line. And my range, okay, within here, uh, so I'm going to copy this. Now, my range is not going to be all of this, right? So this is fine. That's for my domain. But this is clearly not my range because this parabola is opening up upwards and I do have a minimum. So that minimum, wherever that might be, okay, is going to lie somewhere there. And my range is going to be basically from that minimum going up. So I am forced, if I really want to find what the range here is, I kind of have to find that vertex right? And then from that vertex, I can then gauge um, what the actual range might be. So how do you find it, right? Because this quadratic is in standard form. Now, the vertex, if we had it in the vertex form, then that would have made our life a lot easier, right? Now, what does that entail? How do you do that? Well, you have to complete the square, Right? So if you want to complete the square and then put it into the quadratic form, great. Okay? Then we will find it. Now, if, you find, if you've forgotten about the completing the square, you know, I'll, I'll put up a link up above there for putting quadratics into vertex form. Okay? For those who have forgotten it, 
And I'm gonna do that here kind of in fast forward motion to transform this, all right? So I'll be right back. All right, so I just completed the square to try to find, okay, so my vertex right there. So notice it was negative four, three, and then negative 22 over three. So it's not exactly how I drew it here. It's gonna be, you know, shifted over into basically kind of this quadrant over there. And I'll plot it in just a second so that you can see it. But the point being here is what we wanna know for the range is that we wanna know this minimum, right? Because it's opening upwards, so we wanna be able to know that minimum. So if you wanted to know the entire range now, so y indeed, okay, can be in the real numbers, but y is going to be greater or equal to negative 22 over three, and it's bigger than that. And that is now your range. And that's for a quadratic. So notice that it is actually harder to be able to see that. Let me plot this just for you right now, again, and then I'll be right back. So there it is, it's plotted. Now, of course, if you're in school, you can't always use the plots. Um, I mean, or maybe you can, you know, you can utilize certain tools to help you. But notice, so here is your, so it's negative four over three, which is indeed 1.33333. And then you have negative seven, um, 0.3333, which uh, is, I guess, the 22. So that would that would have been the 22 over three. And indeed, when you're looking at it now, okay, so you can see that the range, it can't go below it. It just doesn't exist. So the range is everything above. All right, so now that we're kind of figured out what the domain and the range is uh, for this, I guess, quadratic, the next question, is okay, so how do we find the inverse? Now in the beginning when you're studying these inverses, you probably will just simply begin with lines and those ones you saw a few examples of and those ones are all right. Now for quadratics, you do actually have the tools to figure out what the inverse is. Now in the beginning, you know, you may not know and then you kind of need a little bit of a hint. So the hint that I will give you, now we have actually already done this. So right here, we put the quadratic into basically a vertex form. So I'm gonna rewrite it here. So we have three, I'm not gonna... Now, once you have it in the vertex form, you, you can actually try to isolate and solve for this X. So that is certainly doable in this format. If you have it in this format, unfortunately, you know, it doesn't always work. And in this case, you would have had a really hard time to try to do it. So my, um, Kind of hint to you is when you're working with quadratics and somebody asks you for the inverse always first try to complete the square and then put it into the vertex form now once you have the vertex form so in terms of isolating this because now we got to go in in reverse right because we want to find the inverse so we want to be able to isolate this for x um, so the first step so i'm going to shift y and the 22 over 3 Okay, I'm gonna put it over on the other side, so it's gonna become positive, it's gonna become this. So that step, you know, shouldn't be really a big deal. Now we wanna get rid of this three here, so I'm gonna divide both sides by three. We're gonna get y over three plus 22, and then if you divide that by three again, this is gonna turn into be a nine, and you have this on the right-hand side. Now you can take the square root of both sides to get rid of that. And that's gonna turn out, okay, to be this. And let me copy this down in here. So it's gonna be the square root of that. It's gonna leave you with x and then four over three. And then you just simply move this four over three on the other side. So you're gonna have overall, so let me duplicate this. Okay, I'm gonna just rewrite it, okay? And then when you're shifting over the four over three, so it's gonna look something like that. Now, because you have the inverse, so let me just swap the X and the Y. Okay, so right there. Um, and then that, so that's your inverse. Now, the <clears throat> problem with these is that you do have 
kind of the square root. And as you know, uh, square roots, at least for when you're doing relations, we typically try to keep them as a function and we always just kind of take the positive. So I'm gonna graph this for you. And then I'm gonna show you if you wanted to graph the entire thing. So meaning you wanna have both the positive and negative answers out of this square root. Um, I'll show you what to do, all right? And then let's just see. So I'm gonna graph our original one. So this one right here, and then this one right here, so that you can see that it is actually being reflected along the y is equal to x axis, all right? So let me do that, I'll be right back. All right, so here it is, okay? So you have your, so the red one is the original one, and then the inverse is actually made up of two things. Um, so you will notice here that the blue, okay, which is basically the square root, and then it's minus four over three, so you see that it's rising. Now, because decimals will graph it as a function, it's not gonna graph ever the, the other one, um, okay, the bottom one, because it's no longer a function, right? So this inverse is not a function. Um, so you would have to define certain different domains um, and different restrictions. And you'll notice the green one there, I put a negative in front of that square root. So the negative just simply means it reflects it back. And then we have our entire um, nice inverse, okay? So the red one is the original, and then this, okay, the second one is the inverse. And I do encourage you to play around with this so that you can see it. And notice that indeed, you know, it's basically reflected uh, very nicely along this y is equal to x. So that's how you find the inverses of quadratics. So just complete the square and then, you know, go from there. So that's this example in, I guess, uh, a nutshell, all right, so that you have that one. Okay, so let's move over to the next one. And I hope you noticed I changed my shirt. This next example is pretty interesting because now we run into um, kind of functions or relations where you you have a denominator or something is happening in the denominator and it's not just a number. So let's break this down again. Our goal is to try to find the domain and then the range. Um, so domain is, okay, so which values of X um, do we actually have an output for uh, in this particular function? Or is there some value of X that, you know, just um, gives us some kind of an undefined um, number or we can't really find a real number as a solution. Well, this particular um, example, as you see, so I put up two, you know, X, Y charts because um, I guess in reality, what, you know, what this is, is, you know, you can think of it as just kind of multiplication of four plus X which we know is just a line, and then it's being multiplied by one over um, x minus two, and x minus two, so, you know, for those who are familiar, you know, with the parent function, so it really just comes from uh, kind of like a shift from one over x. So we know how these two things look like. I mean, four plus x is pretty simple to try to draw out here. So I'm gonna try to draw it out so it goes through four, all right, so it kind of goes in this direction as a positive slope of one. So that looks like that. And then the one over X minus two is, so it comes from the one over X, but now it's being shifted over. Um, so we're gonna shift it by two. So it, it's gonna look kind of like that, right? So we're, this is what we're used to. So it has um, asymptotes, I guess, at zero and then, um, at x is equal to two, the vertical one. So it has two asymptotes. If you've forgotten about asymptotes, you know, put up a link up above there. Now, um, of course, this, it's multiplication of these two. So it's not like you can just add these two up, um, you're multiplying, but it does give us quite a lot of information um, from just that. Now, I will tell you that whenever you are dealing with anything in the denominator, it always kind of causes a problem. I mean, unless the denominator is just some some number, some real number, and it doesn't have any variable in it. In this case, it does have the x. So what's the problem with the denominator? Well, you can see that, you know, we do have actually quite a big problem because, 
you know, notice that here, you know, in this, um, we actually don't really have any value at x is equal to 2 here. So that is indeed a problem. So at x is equal to 2, we can't have a value. And you can see that, and this is a common trend whenever you're dealing with denominators, you kind of always have to restrict them so that they don't give you a 0. Because if we put x is equal to 2 here, so for the original function, what you're going to get is 4 plus 2, and then divided by um, 2 minus 2, so you're going to get 6 over 0, which is undefined, and then therefore that's why this thing is just blowing up on us. So this particular um, function, um, we can't have x is equal to 2, because it's going to give us an undefined um, output. Now everything else, so notice if you're multiplying these two, I mean, this one is, is beautiful because it's just a line, so we don't have to worry about anything in terms of the numerator. And then in the um, denominator, you know, we are going to run into problems, I guess, as we kind of approach negative infinity and then approach positive infinity because it's going to kind of get taken over by those. So I'll talk about that in just a second. But that is more with the range and that's not nothing to do with the domain. So for our domain here, so what you have is so our domain is basically, you know, all the real numbers that we have, but we cannot have x is equal to two. So I'm going to put that restriction in there. So that's our domain. Now for our range uh, that we have, so uh, within here, I guess, you know, we are going to run into a problem um, in terms of the range. Now, I guess you can graph the entire thing. So we can use decimals and I'll do that as well, just so that you can see it. But if you combine these two things, I want you to think about um, something. So as we approach x is equal to 2, our, our, our outputs start to blow up on us. Um, so actually, it doesn't really matter what happens here in the numerator. Um, because as you approach x is equal to 2, your, your numerator is going to be approaching 6. So I mean, it's fixed. But your denominator is going to be approaching um, basically okay, 0 as you approach. So if you're coming in, if it's approaching 0, so those things are going to be blowing up on us. And that's what you see here. So we certainly have um, our range kind of going off into infinity okay, in the um, positive direction and also in the negative direction as well. Now, what happens as you kind of go out as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger? So within here, so because you have 4 plus x and then you have x minus 2. So let's say, you know, we're thinking about so x is kind of becoming very large. And, you know, sometimes we'll write it like this, you know, so it's kind of approaching infinity. So what happens there? You know, the question mark within here. So this is kind of your first idea of saying that, okay, well, if I substitute a very big number here and here, these two, this four, and then this minus two won't really make a big difference, right? Because what you have is you're going to have x plus four. So this is going to be slightly bigger on top than this number. But imagine this is, you know, a thousand or a million. That four is going to be kind of negligible. And then in the denominator, well, yes, you're going to be minusing two. But again, if this is, you know, a thousand or a million, okay, then it's going to get dominated by that. So really what you're having is, you know, this kind of starts to approach this x over x, okay, and then these two don't really make that big of a difference. Now, x divided by x is just basically one, right? Because, I mean, these two just can cancel each other off. So it looks like... Um, our range is going to be approaching one, um, but it's never really going to reach it because, you know, yes, you do, you're going to have these things. They may not really play that dominant role, but I guess they're still there. And then that's why you're always going to be a little bit away from that one. So what's going to happen is, you know, this is not going to be approaching zero as, as it is for one over x minus two, but it's rather going to be approaching one from the top as you're going this way. And then it's going to be approaching um, plus one from the bottom, okay, if you make it kind of negative as you try to reach it out, all right? Because if you make these things approaching negative, 
very big, large negative numbers. So again, you can have x over x, negative divided by a negative is still a positive. So, you know, let me just uh, draw it out for you just so that you can see it. So we'll have two asymptotes for this. All right, so there you have it. So notice it just kind of got shifted over. It looks very similar to, you know, one over x minus two. And, you know, as you get closer and closer, notice that it basically just starts trying to reach one as these numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger. All right, so you have two asymptotes there. So what does that tell us about the range? It means that our range uh, is basically any number. So that's great. Okay, so our range, so g of x is any number. Um, but, okay, so I guess we have an asymptote, so it's not equal to one. So we don't have uh, one as our answer for our output for this particular um, function, I guess. All right. Now, what about the inverse? You know, does an inverse exist? You know, you saw with linear and quadratics, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of a pain in the butt to try to do these. Now, for your inverse, you can certainly try it. You know, your first go is always, you know, you want to be, I'm going to, instead of writing g of x, I'm going to write y. So this is 4 plus x, okay, over x minus 2. So again, for the inverse, you want to be able to solve for x. So let's do that, and I'll, I'll try to do that in fast-forward fashion for you. Okay, so I'm going to rearrange this formula. All right, so there you had it in kind of fast forward fashion. And yes, you do have to know how to kind of isolate these things. That's why it's so important when you're learning about solving for X, you know, what you have to uh, be able to, to do. And so within here, okay, so this is our inverse. So actually I could isolate for inverse. Now my inverse, um, the domain also is gonna have a problem here because you have X minus one. So that means um, the inverse does not exist at x is equal to one. And then, you know, what happens, um, I guess, as you go on in terms of your range, you know, you can also um, try to check that. Now let's, let's graph this inverse and let's see if it's um, even a function. Let's see what this gives us. All right, so there you have it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess this inverse is, is fine. We, we do have a problem at X is equal to one, uh, but everywhere else it actually is a, a function. So that's pretty neat. And so the inverse is the blue that you see there. And then the red one is the original, um, that we had. And indeed, you know, so if you would put Y is equal to X, cause you kind of want to see a reflection, okay. Within that line, um, it does look like a pretty neat reflection. Okay. So that's another example um, for you to think about okay so for domains um, always you know worry about the denominator because you don't want it to be equal to zero so. all right so this example uh, i guess it gets a little bit tougher so in the previous one we did have a denominator that we saw but it was a very simple denominator now in this one we have a quadratic and when we have quadratics um okay so then what what do we do now, because we've studied quadratics in the past, um, I'll put up a link again up above there for quadratics, um, kind of those from grade 10. Um, we know that we can uh, probably figure out what the zeros um, are in here in terms of this quadratic or what the roots are, so that when we are trying to find the domain for this entire thing, um, we know we're gonna be bounded by um, a domain which we cannot have values that uh, if we have x uh, when substituted in here that give us zero right now i'm going to try to break this down now not every quadratic is possible but i can certainly try to find um, if this has some legitimate uh, roots or zeros of this quadratic okay so here um, x squared minus x oh actually it's going to be x 
um, minus 3 and then x plus 2. So that one wasn't as bad. Now, if you can't do it, of course, you know, you can use any method that you like um, to try to find. Now, once we have this, then we know um, that from here, x is equal to 3 is going to give us a problem because if we substitute, that's going to make the denominator 0, and then therefore we're going to get 3 over 0. So it's going to give us an undefined output. So our domain um, cannot include 3. And then from here, we cannot have x is equal to negative 2, I guess, because if we substitute negative 2, we're going to run into the same problem. So our domain is basically, so any numbers that we have, but x is not allowed to be negative 2, and it is not allowed to be 3. So that is our domain. Now, what about our range? Now, our range is going to be much harder here to find than in some of the previous examples. And, you know, maybe you might have to utilize a graph to try to help you. But, you know, what if you couldn't? You know, how can we kind of slowly maybe start thinking about it? So we know that we're going to run into issues between, you know, kind of negative 2 and 3. So something is going to happen. So if we had a graph in here. So I'm going to try to give you the thought process of like finding range on these hard ones. And I know that I always push it a little bit more, um, especially here as you're starting these introduction to functions than most teachers might do um, for you, but it's going to make you think, hopefully. Okay, so at negative two, so we know we have some kind of a problem in here, most likely. So this is going to be an asymptote at negative two. And then at three, we're going to probably have another asymptote somewhere along there because of the fact that those values just simply do not exist. And in, um, in terms of the outputs do not exist, okay, for x is ne at negative 2 and 3. Okay, so great. So that's my x, this is my y. And if you divide this up, um, so the way that I like to kind of think about this is to make my life simpler. So, you know, you really have three regions now. You have this region, um, and this is for everything. So x, which is basically less than negative 2. You have this second region right here. Now, for this region right here, you have your x, which is between negative 2 and 3. And then you have your third region here, where x is basically greater than 3. Now we know that we can't have negative two and three for x. So those are really the three different things that you can start thinking about. Um, and now you can say that, okay, well, um, you know, can I figure out the range in these um, particular regions? So if you would start with this region right there, so what would happen? You know, you can start thinking about, you know, trying to plug in the numbers in here. Now, if you are going to approach negative 2, right? Um, so as you're approaching negative 2, you know that the denominator is going to be blowing up on you. So it's definitely going to be blowing up on you. Um, and now, so now, is it going to be blowing up in the positive direction or is it going to be blowing up in the negative direction? Okay, so that's something that you're going to have to think about. So notice, so what you have is, so in the numerator in this region, so three is just gonna stay as three, okay? So that's one. Now it's gonna be divided by, and now you have, you know, you're kind of trying to approach um, negative two, right? So is it gonna kind of blow up like this or is it gonna blow up like that, right? So you wanna be able to kind of see which way is it gonna be going in these directions. And in here, you know, I do encourage you to try to plug in a few numbers and try to see, okay? So, you know, if we start plugging in, so I'm going to, let's say, approach um, negative 2. So it's going to be negative 2. All right, so this is less than that. So let's put, you know, a funky number like this and try to see what happens um, there. So, you know, for that, I can take out my calculator. <laughs> Okay, so notice that this denominator, um, the way that I have it, it's positive. 
So you're going to have, you know, so 3 divided by 0, 0, 5, 0, 0. So notice this 3 divided by a very small number, indeed, it's going to start blowing up. And it looks like it's positive. Um, and now you can, again, you can try another one. You can try, you know, something maybe even smaller like that. Okay, to see just to double check for yourself. So it looks like it's kind of blowing up positive. Now, what about if you go out further out in this direction? Okay, what will happen um, then to your output Y? So as it gets bigger and bigger. But if you go bigger and bigger negative, okay, so notice again, so what you're gonna have is, you're gonna have three divided by X squared minus X minus six. So this right here, is not really going to play a role when x is very big and negative. It's going to really be dominated by this because it's squared, right? And again, you can substitute. So imagine substituting in here a million, all right, or a thousand. And then you square it, okay? So if it's a thousand, now you're going to get a million. Um, and then here you might say, well, wait a minute, but don't you still have to put in your x in here? Yes. But a very big number, so let's say 1,000 squared, now it's negative, okay? But if you square a negative, it's going to still be positive. Now minus, okay, so this is going to be that, and then minus 6. So it's going to be dominated by this. Yes, sure, you know, so you're going to get this and this. It's going to turn out to be positive in here. Um, and then minus the 6, it's kind of going to be irrelevant. But notice, if you square the 1,000 here, it's going to give you a million, so a million plus or minus a thousand, still pretty much close to a million, right? Okay, so that's what's gonna happen. So your denominator is gonna be blowing up on you. It's gonna be very, very big positive. So what is happening? Now you have a three, the denominator is blowing up on you. So it's positive. So three divided by a very big number. So it looks like it's going to be approaching this, right? So it's gonna kind of be going in this direction. So my range is going to be basically, now notice that because of the three, it's gonna be approaching zero. So it looks like my range is above zero, right? And then everything above, because it's just gonna to start to blow up in this direction here. So I know that my range is definitely everything. So range includes at least, okay, all of these. And now you can play the same game Okay, with this number three. And then with the number three, you're gonna notice, okay, so what happens there? You can play just what I did right now. And then you can start thinking about, okay, what happens in this particular range? Okay, so as I keep playing with the numbers, right? And you can keep substituting. So as I approach negative two, as I approach three, but you also will have to check, you know, what happens here in the middle? You know, does this, you know, what happens there? Is there maybe a max or is there a minimum, right? Um, am I missing something, okay, within here? So that's a pretty neat um, idea for you to think about. Now in grade 11, the tools you have is, you know, you can have the tools of substituting in the numbers, just kind of checking through, um, and then you can also graph directly, right? So I'm not gonna go through this substitution of numbers, um, you know, that's something that you can try, but I will show you, all right, so I kind of <clears throat> drew this out on decimals already, so for us, okay, so notice the left-hand side, so the minus two, um, we were dead on, right, so notice, so that it goes to zero, and then it blows up on us on the left. On the right-hand side, for x is greater than three, it does the same thing, it's like a reflection, but notice in the middle, in here, um, I don't have a range, right? I don't have outputs values. Like it looks like it's blowing up here as you go down, but it's blowing up negative, right? It's blowing up negative in this direction as it gets closer to the three. So that's fine, you know, we can find those. But here in the middle, notice it doesn't get actually passed. There is a maximum point there. That maximum point is negative 0 0.48. And then there's nothing above it um, basically until, you know, you reach that zero, which we talked about. So there is, you know, our values within here, so our range, um, this is a hard one to, to be able to do. So our range looks like our output Y, okay? 
Okay, so sure, it's you know all these real numbers. However, okay, um, y is going to be okay. So it 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 is definitely um, y is above zero. So we know that. Um, but y, and I'm running out of space here. I'm going to put comma. But y is actually less than negative 0.48 because that was the maximum we could do. So there is no range in between that 0 and negative 0 0.48. So that's what you see here. All right. And that's pretty neat. So I'm really pushing you to understand these domain and ranges. And yes, you know, you can use graphing, but you can also start substituting to think about, you know, how would you do that? And then as the, the, the functions or relations get harder and harder, these things get really tough to try to, you know, figure out. Um, the next question is, you know, does, is there an inverse for this? You know, could we, could we figure out an inverse um, for this thing? So, you know, how would we do an inverse, you know, and how would we look like? And um, the trick, for finding the inverse is the same. So, you know, this is our original, so copy. Now, not all inverses actually exist. Now, because we have a quadratic in the denominator, all right, so we have a quadratic in the denominator, um, I talked about, you know, and gave you an example when you do have a relation or a function, which is a quadratic. And I said, always try to put it into vertex form if you can, if you're trying to find inverses because it's easier to do. So I'm going to do that as well here. I'm going to complete the square, put it in vertex forms, meaning the denominator. And then I'm going to try to basically swap my y and my x, right? Because I'm trying to find the reverse, right? I'm trying to find the inverse. So let's try to do that. And I'll do that in kind of fast forward fashion to see if we can get an answer out. All right, be right back. All right, so at this point, okay, so I just completed the square for us. So now what we're gonna do is, this is in the um, denominator. So I, I'm, I'm gonna bring it up to the numerator. I'm gonna multiply both sides by that denominator. And then I'm gonna rearrange, all right? So that's the next step to try to find the inverse. All right, okay, so we found it, um, it exists, okay, so we have the square root, so because we're going to have the square root, so we know we're going to run into problems, right, because the square roots, uh, we typically take just the positive, but if we really want to see the full inverse, you know, we're going to have to take both the positive and the negative, so I'm going to leave that in there, um, but as soon as you get into square roots as your inverses, you know, you probably will know um, seeing from the previous examples that they won't be an actual function because they won't pass our vertical line test. Okay, so let me actually plot this and then I'll come back to finish this off. All right, so the, and there you have it, like super ugly. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you can distinguish there the purple is our original one. I don't want to cross them off in here because it was a little bit long to, uh, to try to do them. Um, and then you have, I did put in the positive and negative. Um, so notice that, so here, I mean, oh boy, this is gonna, so y is equal to x. That's the kind of the reflection line between all of that. And um, you know, you do, it, it does look like there is some kind of a reflection there, okay? So that you have which is kind of super neat, so it's very symmetrical, that's, but that's an ugly inverse, right? Um, and unfortunately, the inverse in here, it's not a function. It's not going to pass the vertical line test. So what you're looking for, you're looking at the black and then the red uh, combined. That's the inverse itself. So I mean, even let's say like pick six, for example, notice that six, you know, it has two points there, right? If you're going to keep both the positive and negative of the square roots. But it's really, really neat. And I mean, the the power of decimals is just crazy good. And I hope that, you know, as long as you can get some intuition, 
uh, especially in high school, it's great um, to utilize these graphing tools for yourself. All right, so that is it. So the inverse really doesn't exist. It's not a function, um, but you know, in terms of graphing it, we can see that we do have an inverse. Sorry, the it's not a function, okay, as an inverse, but we do have an inverse that we manipulated, that we got. Boom. All right, so here's the last one for this particular example, as you can see it. So we have an absolute in the numerator, and it, this is actually of t, so it's not necessarily of x, but we can think of t as our kind of input. And then in the denominator, we have uh, a cubic, okay? So it's a polynomial, but it's not a quad quadratic in any way. It's uh, one order higher. So how do we tackle this one? Again, so don't get intimidated by these. You know, if you do see something like that on a quiz or a test, and, you know, they ask about domains and ranges. And for the first one for the domain, okay, so we always think about, okay, so first in the numerator, I mean, we have an absolute value. So um, pretty much everything we can input for t in the numerator, there isn't any restriction there. And as you remember, okay, so this, you know, absolute value t, so it's going to look kind of like this. Now, in the denominator, we do have a problem because we know that we cannot have the denominator equal to zero uh, because if it does equal to zero and then in the numerator we have some, um, some number, we're going to run into trouble and we're going to have an undefined kind of output which we can't really have. Um, now, if you were working on this and this was, a, let's say, a quiz or a test, I mean, sometimes, you know, we can take these, you know, cubics or higher order, and sometimes we can try to figure out, you know, what the roots are. So, I mean, ideally, what we want to be able to see is, um, you know, we want to be able to see when does this, um, in this case, this is cubed, is equal to zero, right? So, we want to find out all the values for t when this is equal to zero, and it's not easy to do. So, I typically will say if you can't see it right off the bat, you know, if you spend a little bit of time um, and you can't really kind of figure out because it's not an easy thing. I mean, in quadratics, we, we know more or less on what to do. We have enough tools, but in um, cubics, we don't always have all the tools available and they're not as easy to try to use. So what I encourage students to do is when they're defining their domain, now, so long as the numerator, and in this case, the numerator, everything is fine there. Um, we have, so what I would say is, all right, so just define it as you normally would. And then if you can't really figure out if there are, um, you know, zeros to that denominator, just, you know, put in this, that this, you know, cannot equal to zero. And if you do that, then at least you're telling the reader, whoever's doing this, that, hey, they got to be careful that they don't set T such that it is equal to zero there in the denominator. So if you wanted to find what the roots are here, I mean, there are tools that you can find, you know, you can utilize kind of calculators or applications to find. So let me just show you, I'm gonna kind of arbitrarily go in here. So if you wanna find roots, uh, you can put in roots calculator for polynomials, for example, because that's what you're dealing with. And so here's a few of them. And, you know, they're probably going to give us some approximate answer, but so be it. Um, so I don't, I'm, I mean, you can use any of these just to kind of test it out. Okay, so let's put it in here. 0 0.2 was x cubed minus, so 4x squared and then minus 0 0.9. So that was our polynomial and what it's going to find is our zeros or at least approximate them for us. So let's see. Okay, so... It looks like there was one, so approximately at 20.011. Um, so it's probably rounded, I don't know. Um, and so that, what, is, what it's telling us actually, so here, so this T, okay, so, you know, so T basically cannot equal to was 20.011. I don't know if it was, um, if it continued or not. So maybe it's some irrational number, who knows? So you have to be careful a little bit with the roots, but at least it gives you some perspective, okay? So that means that this has only one um, zero, one root. And as you approach that value, 
okay? For t, it's gonna basically make this zero, which means that you know your domain cannot include that particular number. Now your range um, that you have, so this one is a little bit harder to do. So if it has only um, one problem at t not equal to 20.011, so something happens along that, um, it's gonna blow up or some, something might happen around there. So let's take a look and see you know, what would happen to the range. Now, because it's a relatively complicated um, numerator over denominator, as you're working with these, you know, think of what the range would be. Let's do this just by graphing, right? So to try to kind of see um, what happens. So I have um, pre-graphed this one for us. And so here is the graph. So this is kind of how it looks like. And notice, so around that 20.011, notice it does, it does look like it's blowing up there. Um, on us, but everything else seems fine. Now there is something funny happening here at zero, but that shouldn't probably surprise you because we have that absolute value there, right? So that absolute value, you know, if you, so here, if I plotted the, just the absolute value within here, and let's say that was it. So don't forget that that's what it would be, right? That numerator that we have. So I'm not surprised that something funny is happening there. But it looks like, so we do have a, you know, a zero, so it's right there. Um, and then for your range, okay, so let's see what happens here. So we have, the range is actually everything. So yes, we have an asymptote um, here at that 20.0, whatever, 1.1 one, one around there. So it's blowing up on us. But in terms of the range, so the only problem here is the zero, but there is a zero that we have in the range, which is right there, right? It's the 0 0.00. 0. So your range actually has no restrictions. We have a value for every single um, Y. And so that's uh, pretty interesting, okay? So here, in terms of your range, so when you would be defining it, so basically, okay, it's any number that we have, um, any real number. Now, Finding an inverse of this, I'm going to kind of let this one go. Um, I don't want to torture you, okay, especially as you're kind of kicking these things off for the inverse. We've done a lot of inverses up to this point, but you can kind of think about, you know, how would you approach a question like this with respect to the inverse? Um, you would probably, in my opinion, you would have to kind of break this down again in terms of regions to try to see if you can break down the inverse in some way. Um, if it's possible or not. All right, but let's stop it here. So in terms of the domain and range, I think you've seen enough examples to hopefully be now a little bit more comfortable in creating a domain and range. Okay, thanks for watching. We'll see you in a future video. Cheers, everybody.